Hello and welcome to today's webinar on IFS extensibility. My name is Rick Bucchino. I'm a senior client manager with IFS North America. So IFS extensibility is also referred to as custom objects. So you may hear those terms. They are somewhat interchangeable. Custom objects in IFS are a collection of features that are used to extend and modify the IFS application through configuration. This helps our customers maintain a standard supported product with user configuration rather than customization. These are all configured by a system administrator. And it's important to know that IFS security is built in. What I'll do here is take you through a quick tour of the custom objects available in IFS, and then we'll drill down into each in a little more detail. So the first thing are quick reports. And quick reports are really used to quickly create simplified on-screen reports. Custom events are used to set up triggers in the application and actions to perform when those events are triggered. Custom menus are used to configure new actions to be available in the right mouse menu or as we refer to it now as the context menu. Custom fields are fields that can be added to pages and reports without programming. They could be completely new fields or they could make reference to an already existing field in the application. Hyperlink fields are also custom fields, but it allows you to configure a URL to open a website or potentially an email address. And custom references allow you to create a reference from a page where it could be shown using custom fields. It could be, for example, adding a list of values dialog, and then you can use the list of values dialog to select the value. Custom logical units allow you to create entirely new storage for business objects that don't already exist in IFS. You configure the attributes or columns, whether they're persistent or read-only. You have choices for text, number, date, enumeration or combo box type fields, and reference data types. And you have the ability to specify indexing. When you create custom logical units, you then have the ability to create custom pages to be able to access that new logical unit, to be able to add and maintain data in it. And the, these custom pages are like an ordinary table window in IFS. And related to that, we have custom detailed page. It's the same thing. You can add a detail page. It's a single record view. Uh, it allows you to enter and maintain the data that you've created in custom logical units. Custom tabs make it possible to configure on an existing IFS standard page, a tab, a new tab that could be a custom logical unit, for example. And this works on any page, most any page in IFS that handles tabs. Conditional fields are available on many forms, and it's possible to set conditions on a field that steers the behavior of the field based on values in other fields. And finally, we have application configuration packages. And this is functionality that provides you the means to package one or more custom objects to export them and install them on, for example, a different database. An example would be you might be setting everything up in test and you want to move it to production. So the application configuration package gives you a way to group and handle all of that in one easy step. It, it also provides you some basic life cycle functionality for the stuff that you've configured in the application. And it, it helps you with development and maintenance of all your configurations. All right, now we'll drill down into a little more detail on each one of those. First up, is quick reports. Again, quick reports are used to create uh, simplified on-screen type reports. 
Here's an example of a SQL based quick report, which I'll describe in a little more detail. It looks like a standard IFS table window. It has all the same properties, including the ability to export, print, chart, and etc. Here's an example of using the function where you create and maintain a SQL based quick report. Note that also that quick reports are presentation objects, so we can manage the, the grants or permissions to view these. But a quick tour around the screen, you'll notice that we give the quick report a title. We have a type of quick report. We can categorize them so that we can create a navigator type folder type view. Think of categories as folders. Here's a reference to the presentation object that gets created. And down below is where we enter the SQL state. And here's a second example of using a function in IFS called Query Builder. And with the Query Builder, if we're not strong or familiar with building from SQL, we can use the Query Builder to create SQL in a more user-friendly way. And in this example, quick report for shop orders. And I'm going after a couple of different views in the database of shop orders. I'm looking for the shop order itself and the shop order material information. Here I have defined in this upper section, I've defined where, what columns are going to be included in my quick report. This middle section is in essence the where clause of a SQL statement or the, the filters that you apply. And down below is where I define the joins between different views and what fields they join on. Here's uh, an example of an executed uh, quick report for some business opportunities that I created. And we have the ability to right click and uh, do a number of things. For example, we can export the data to Excel. I could rerun the query. Um, I could output it to uh, and print it if I chose, if I wanted it on paper, or I can also chart it. And simply using the quick chart take capability, I can click that, define my chart, and save that. And then anytime I run quick chart, I have the ability to view it this type of format too. And of course, these charts can be printed and used in presentations and so on. All right, switching gears, we'll talk about custom events. Custom events are used to set up which actions we want to perform when a certain event is triggered in the application. There are custom defined events and application defined events. The difference is that application defined events are delivered by IFS and custom defined events are configured in the solution manager by you. When you configure one of these events and enable it, a trigger is created in the database. Here's an example of a custom event that will fire when someone modifies a product structure or bill of material. You'll notice that the event is given an ID and a description. The logical unit is referenced based on the table that we're monitoring. In this case, it's called manufacturing structure tab. And we can define when should this trigger fire. And in this case, we're saying only when objects are changed or removed. And only, and a further filter is only when these attributes are changed or these columns. So if someone changes a part number, alternative number, a bomb type, a component part, quantity per, and so on, the event will fire. In this section, here are the attributes that are available when creating event actions, which I'll talk about in a minute. And at the lowest part, you can see custom attributes where it's possible to have you add additional attributes that aren't already existing in this particular logical unit. And you'll notice out on the upper right, we have two hyperlinks, one to create a new action and the second one to show existing actions. And in this case, there is one existing action. And here is that action. So the event is when the product structure is modified, it will do a streams message. And a streams message is, is the screen pop-up to the user. In this case, uh, this particular action is only gonna fire if the part number is 29-321 in my, my demo example here. So we can set conditions for performing the action and it can be one or more conditions. And down below we define the 
action details. So who did it come from? Who is it sent to? What's the subject? What's a URL? So we can drill down from the action. And then we can define in the message, we find what should be presented to the user in the action message. When we're defining an event action, we have different types of action that are possible to use. Here, I'll just give you a brief rundown. We have uh, first email, which will send email to a recipient using the mail server setup and IFS Connect. This event action is possible to subscribe to. So when we define event actions, we also can define whether or not we want users to be able to subscribe to it or not. The next one is execute online SQL. This will execute a SQL statement in the current database, and it's intended to execute a method or an update or an insert. It doesn't return any values, it just will execute a statement. Application message creates an application message that's handled by IFS Connect. A task creates a task to one or, or more users, and tasks are shown to users in the IFS Enterprise Explorer in the task panel at the bottom of the screen. We have the opportunity to start a workflow, which will call an external uh, web workflow type service. And the intention is to be able to call a workflow engine that exposes web services to start, start a new instance of a defined workflow. The streams message we talked about, that creates a, an on-screen pop-up, if you will, that will bring some information to the user. And lastly, we have REST call, and that sends a REST or representational state transfer call using the REST sender setup in IFS Connect. Now we'll switch to custom menus, which are used to configure new actions to be available in the context menu. We commonly refer to it as the right mouse menu. However, with new touch type devices, more appropriately, we refer to it as the context menu. Most of the pages in IFS applications have predefined context menus. If an application user has a need for additional actions to be performed in a window, system administrator can configure new actions to be available in the context menu. Each user can then decide if they want to use the standard menus or the ones configured by the administrator or both. And the choice is made per window, so it's possible to use standard menus in one window and custom menus in another window. Further, it's possible for the user to hide disabled context menu items. This is really helpful where the menu might get a bit long for some functions. All of these settings are saved in the user's profile. A little more on custom menus. Here's an overview of a number of menu items created for the inventory part form in my demo database. And when I highlight one of these and right, right click or choose my context menu, it takes me down to the details of where we define the custom menu item. In this case, we're drilling down to open the sales part form. So we're, we're coming from the inventory part window. We're going to create a new window with transfer, meaning I'm going to open the related part number in the new window. And the destination window, in this case, is sales part. This menu text is what will appear to the user when they hit the right mouse button or or access the context menu. The key translation, it's where I define what data is being transferred from the source window to the destination window. In this case, I'm sending the part no and the site. You'll notice out here on the right, it shows me all of the different men custom menu items that I've added to this particular inventory part screen. And I have the opportunity to set the order of those and add separators. I can even add conditions on when they should appear or not. And we can define, as you'll notice in the lower right, we can define translations for any menu items that we add. Now we're gonna to switch to talk about custom fields. Custom fields are fields and columns, depending on the window type. Uh, that can be added to pages and reports without programming. They could be completely new fields, or they could 
simply be a field being visible that is a reference to an already existing field somewhere else in the application. In addition, we have the opportunity to define a hyperlink field, and this is uh, a custom field in this example that I've placed on the customer master that is a URL to take me to this customer's website. Further, we also can add what are called custom enumerations. An enumeration is a drop-down or combo box. These are used throughout app, IFS applications. You can even define your own. So it's a fixed drop-down list of values, and you can store it as a custom attribute on pretty much any form. So drilling down into a little more detail on custom fields. When I define a custom field, it's done from a screen like this. In this case, I'm accessing the existing logical unit called purchase order. And I have at the bottom a number of attributes or custom fields that I have added to be available on the purchase order screen. For example, you can see that the PO priority is one. I have another one where maybe I want to present the site name or some information about the supplier's address. Speaking about enumerations, and this in my example, PO priority, we have to define the enumeration. And that's done on a screen called custom enumeration that you see here. The enumeration can be seen as a data type. So what you really do when creating the custom enumeration is to create a new data type in the application. A custom enumeration is a fixed list of values that can be stored in a specific custom field. Each value has a database representation, that's seen here as DB value, and a client representation. This is what the user sees on the screen. It's possible to define the sequence of the enumeration so that you can, you can set the order when the user hits the dropdown, what order should they see these client values in. And you also have the opportunity to create translations for those client values. So if you have users in other languages, such as Spanish, you can define the Spanish equivalents of each one of those client values. Here, when I'm setting up, for example, custom field called PO priority, after I've set up the enumeration, here's where I reference which enumeration should I use in my custom field. All right, we're going to switch gears and take it up a notch. Now we're going to talk about custom logical units. As I said before, the custom logical unit gives you the ability to create a new storage table for IFS business objects that don't already exist in the IFS application. Here you configure the attributes or columns, whether they're persistent, read only, are they what are their their attributes related to those columns? Are they text and the length of the text? Are they number? Are they date and date and you have date and date time types? Whether they are an enumeration or combo box and reference data. And as I mentioned before, you can also specify whether or not they're indexed, which helps you when searching on these uh, different attributes. And then you publish it to the database once you've defined it. Once you've done that, you have the ability to create custom pages. And as I said, custom pages are, there are two types. There's a overview or table window type. And then there's a detail page or form view for a single record. So the custom page allows you to create, as I said, the overview or multi-record type page from a custom logical unit. And you can add it to your navigator or shortcuts. Then you use it like an ordinary table window, and it has all the typical capabilities such as output channels, printing, graphing, uh, reorganizing, the column chooser, etc. Uh, the custom detail page functionality makes it possible to add a form type or single record view to logical unit data. And these can be used to enter, view, and maintain the data that's in your custom logical unit. And here's an example of a custom page for company vehicles that I created in my demo database. And this is the overview of multi-record type view. Now I'm going to show you, using some of those examples, I'm going to show you how we use them is in what's referred to as a custom reference. And a custom reference is 
where you want to present some data from another part of the application, including custom logical units. And if I'm accessing a custom logical unit, I can choose just like a normal list of values. I can hit F8 or the list of values icon and it gives me a, a list of values to choose and then save in the record. For, in this example you're seeing here, in my employee file, I created a custom field called assigned vehicle. And that custom field is a reference to my custom logical unit called company vehicles. When I hit the list of values, I get a list of all of the data that's in the custom logical unit called company vehicles. And I can choose one of those and that gets saved in the database against the employee file as a in the custom field on, in this case, the employee file. Now, again, using the same concept of my custom logical unit, using it another way, I can add a custom tab in an appropriate or relevant place in the application. And in this case, I took the company master and defined a custom tab called company vehicles. And that tab is looking at my custom logical unit where I have built out a list of all of the company vehicles that we have in this company. The configuration of a custom tab is, is relatively simple. Again, it can be done right from the screen where we define which page we are going to uh, reference in this custom tab and we define the keys. So the parent key is from the source page, in this case company, and the child key is the field that's in the custom logical unit. In my custom logical unit, I defined a company field. Now we'll talk about conditional fields. With conditional fields, you can add rules that control what data can be entered in a page. You can have rules to make fields mandatory or read-only, and you can have rules that filter drop-down lists depending on values and other fields. These two main functions are called property actions and value set actions, and we'll go through them quickly here. Here's an example of a company record, and I'm going to show you an example of a property action where here on the company master, we want to make the form of business mandatory if the country is set to France. So what I do is I simply right click from the screen itself and choose conditional fields. A dialog box opens and I have the opportunity to select the conditional field that I want to add a property action to. In this case, I selected form of business. I chose the property of mandatory and then down below I add the criteria. And I've said that the criteria is when country equals France. And I can have more than one criteria, but for this example, we'll keep it simple. So form of business will be mandatory when country equals France. Back on the screen, here's a company record where the country is France. And you'll notice that the form of business has now become mandatory. Mandatory fields in IFS, when you're editing a record, are shaded. And that gives you an indication to the user that that field is mandatory. Now we'll take a different example of a value set conditional field. And here is a business opportunity record. And I will choose to restrict the choices in a drop down field depending on the choice in another field. So what I want to do here is I'm going to restrict the choices of the probability highlighted in the upper right depending on the stage ID of the opportunity. So again, I use the value set action to do that. I simply choose the probability field on the left and click on add value set action. When I do that, I then get a list of values that are part of the probability dropdown list. And I simply select the one or more values that I wish the user to see if the stage equals 20. So what I've done in essence is I've added a criteria that says if the stage equals 20, the user can only see 
10% and 25%. And I can add more value set. So I've added another one to the probability where if the stage is 30, the user can only choose 75%. And I want to point out in the upper right, in the red box, you have two icons. One is to enable or disable the condition, and the other, the trash can, is to delete the condition if you no longer want to use it. And lastly, we'll talk about application configuration packages. This is functionality, again, that provides a means to package, export, and then import configurations such as custom objects. It provides you a basic lifecycle functionality to help you in developing and maintaining the configurations. In my example here, I've created an application package called Company Vehicles. And in the lower part of the window, you see items. And I've added three items to this package. I have a custom menu item. I have a custom logical unit and a custom enumeration that are all part of the functionality I created called Company Vehicles. When I do the import of an application configuration package to another database, I also have the possibility to validate the configuration. And when I choose the validate link, it will check all of the objects that I've created in the current database, and it will return to me a response. And in this case, you see three green check marks for the three objects. They're all valid. If I didn't have, if I had an error or warning, I could view the log and it would show me where I have to make some adjustments. I do want to mention there is some good documentation of all of this available with your IFS installation. If you go to the IFS online documentation and click the box in the lower left that reads technical doc, it opens another window or another tab in your browser. And in the technical documentation, in the tree navigator, you will find the item IFS administration and configuration guide. And then under user interface, you'll find custom objects. And then there is a lot of detail for everything we've discussed here today and more. To summarize what I've just discussed, IFS extensibility is really a tool that enables our users to tailor IFS applications to achieve a better fit and adapt and improve the user experience. The purpose of this is really to allow you to maintain a standard and supported product without customizations. I do want to mention that the new IFS Arena client will have similar configuration possibilities. Uh, some of it is already present in Arena. And we will be conducting another webinar in the near future specifically focused on configuration for the IFS Arena client. With that, I'd like to conclude the PowerPoint section and go and show you some software. So here we are in IFS Applications 10, the Enterprise Explorer client. And I'll do a quick run through of some of the custom object functionality that we just discussed in the PowerPoint section. First of all, I've got some recent screens that I'll use to make this flow quicker. Here you see an overview of quick reports in the application. These are where I can view all of the currently configured quick reports. I can see the report title, what type of a quick report it is, in this case, SQL statement. These are the possible choices for different quick reports. Today we've discussed SQL statement and query builder but it's also the possibility to use Crystal Reports and Microsoft Reporting Services Reports. We can see if it's part of any application configuration package, and we can see what category we've chosen to put it in. And again, these categories are defined by you. It's a way of organizing, grouping, or creating a folder type menu, if you will. I'm going to highlight this quick report called Business Opportunity, drill down, and show the details. And this is where the quick report is defined. We have the title, the type. We have the category that we've decided to put it into. And here is the simple SQL statement. Up here on the upper right, you see the ability. We can execute the report. We can export it, the data to Excel. We can export the SQL statement itself. And we can 
click this link to manage the grants. As I mentioned, Quick Reports are presentation objects and you can manage permissions as to who and what roles can see them. If I click on the view report, it takes me to the actual report itself. And here is the execution of that SQL statement, returning to me a list of opportunities and their values. And you can see it's a typical table window. It has the possibility to do sorting, column reorganization, anything really you want to do. You can go to column chooser and organize your columns, hide them, and so on. Again, these type settings are saved in the user's profile. You also have the possibility to right-click and output to Excel to save the data in a file, uh, such as a notepad file or something of that sort, or just send it off to a printer. I also have the opportunity to define output channels. And in this case, I defined an Excel output channel for this particular quick report. Now I'll give you an example of a query builder type report from my recent screens. I can go there. And here is an example of a query builder type report. I've titled it Shop Orders. Down below, I've defined that I'd like to look into two views in the application. One is the view called Shop Order, and the other is the view called Shop Order Material Allocation. If we expand those, you get a list of all of the columns that are available in those different views. And I can simply take and drag those columns off into this pane on the right to be able to add that column to my quick report. I can also do the same thing if I want to add filters or the where clause. I can simply drag and drop them into this middle pane. So if I want, for example, to have creation date as one of my filters, I can add that. You'll notice it puts an and in there automatically for me. And so I'm saying in the filter that the site has to equal 101 and the creation date, I could say, for example, is greater than and April 1st, 2020. And I can save that and I've added that filter. We'll take that out. I can right click and view the report. And here is the execution of that query builder type report. Again, it has all of the same properties as most table windows in IFS. I can right click, I can choose to output it to Excel, I can print it, I can chart it, and so on. I also have the opportunity to right click in the header row and go to my column chooser, decide which columns I want to view and in what order I wish to view them. And again, these type settings are saved in the individual user profiles. Another useful feature of query builder type reports is that I can highlight a given row, right click or use the context menu and drill down to the details. And in this case, it takes me to the particular shop order that I had returned in my query builder type quick report. All right, now we'll talk about events. I have in part of my recent screens, I have a list of events. Here is a list of all of the events in this installation. I can see the event type in this column here, whether it's application defined or custom defined. And again, application defined events are ones that IFS ships with the application and custom defined events are ones that you would create in your installation. Let's take a look at, I've got one here on product structure, which is a custom defined event. I can also see that it is enabled. I'm simply going to right click and drill down to show the details of that event. And you here you see the event ID, a description. This is internal note about what that event is supposed to be triggered on. We can see that the event is enabled. We can see what logical unit and table is being monitored. And we can see here and choose when should this event fire? Should it fire when new objects are created? Yes or no. When objects are changed, yes or no, and objects are removed. In this case, we don't want this to fire when new objects are created. We're only monitoring for changes. And we've also further filtered it to say only when these attributes or columns change. Down below are the different attributes that are available that I've checked off to be available to me to be able to use in the message. And down below is custom attributes where I don't have any defined, but 
you can define custom attributes also. In the upper right, you see create new action link and show actions link. And we'll drill down. We can see that we've got one action so far against this event. And that action is a streams message. Again, here are the list of the possible action types. In this case, it's a streams message. And a streams message is that pop up from the lower left to warn a user when something has occurred in the database. And we can define the message content, who it's coming from, who it's going to, a subject line, a URL back to the screen, the relevant screen for this message, and then some other text in the message. For example, what the old and new values were for the particular changes that took place. What I'll do is I'll do a quick example here. We'll go in and change the quantity per and we'll try to see that this event will fire and return to me a push notification or streams message. I also wish to point out that for this demo, I've also defined that the only time this action is going to occur is if I make changes to this particular part number. So here, using this hyperlink, I can define conditions for the action, and I can have one or more conditions. So I've got a shortcut over to my product structure for that particular part in question, the 29-321 camshaft. And if I was to modify the quantity per assembly, I should get a streams message according to the way I've configured this event. So I'm going to change the quantity to per assembly to 10 and hit save. And you'll notice he pretty much immediately, I got a streams notification. You can see that by the red badge. When I expand the streams panel, you'll see now I've gotten the message. The change to the product structure 29-321 has occurred and the quantity per parent was five and now is 10. I also have the opportunity to click this link. It will take me to the product structure record. If I wasn't on it, I can see who did it, when it occurred, and also I've got some Skype integration here where I can email or see if the user is online with their Skype client. Now I'll switch subjects and talk about custom fields. In my recent screens, I've got a customer master record. And here you can see the typical customer master record. I've got some information, I've got a sticky note, we'll hide that for now. This field in the upper right, primary website, notice it's a custom field and it's a custom hyperlinked field. The way that this is defined, if I right click, go to custom objects, custom fields, and I've got primary website, I can go into the where that's created by choosing edit here. And just so you can see some of how the custom fields are created. Again, I'm on this logical unit called customer info. It's a standard logical unit in, in the application. And you can see that I've defined a couple of attributes or custom fields to be present on this screen. And we'll go through how, in this case, the I want to show the custom website. We'll go into the edit on that. So we've defined that it's a persistent field. We've given it a name. The prompt is what the user will see on the screen. We can add a comment here. Here I can define the data type. In this case, it's because it's a hyperlink field, it's text and it's unformatted. Here I can define the length, the maximum length of the field. And this is where I define that it's a clickable hyperlink. It's insertable, it's updatable, it's searchable. These are choices that I can make. And I can choose to make it a public method and I approve it for publishing. Once I've done that, I simply right click from the header and synchronize. And what that will do is it'll go ahead and redeploy all of the changes that I've made. And that just takes a few seconds to complete. And you can see that now I'm fully synchronized, meaning that all of the attributes and changes have been published into the database. So if we go back 
to the customer master screen. The way that this field gets placed on the form, I right click, go to properties, choose layout, and I click use custom screen layout. And down here you will see, in my case, I've got two custom fields defined, primary email and primary website. If I wanted to put that primary primary email field on here, I simply choose it and I make it highlighted so that it's yellow and then I can position it where I want on the screen using these directional arrows. I can even increase the length of the editable field if I like. Once I've got it positioned where I want it, I simply click OK. And now you see I've placed another custom field on here called primary email address. And I could simply type in here and save that record. And I've now got that email address defined in the customer master. And once I refresh, you'll now see that that became a clickable hyperlink with an email address. And when I click that link, it'll open my mail client on my PC. I'd like to show you another example of using a custom field on a different screen. This time we'll, we'll put a drop-down list on a purchase order. I've got a shortcut or a recent screen on my purchase order here. So what we want to do here is we want to define a drop-down or enumeration and place it on the screen. I've gone ahead and prepared some of this in the interest of time. So if I go to Custom Objects, Custom Fields, you see PO Priority. And cancel that for a second. On this logical unit purchase order, I have three custom fields that are defined. And PO Priority is the one that I want to work with. And you'll notice that that this is an enumeration, and we'll show you how that was defined. If I right click from here and go into Edit on PO Priority, I have also the ability to see the referenced enumeration. Let's take a look at that first. Here is where I defined the custom enumeration. I called it PO Priority. Here's the prompt or how it appears on the screen. And here are the different drop down values that I can provide in that enumeration. And I've got priority one, priority two, priority three, and the sequence number is how I define the order of those when the user clicks the combo box. So coming back here, right click, go to PO priority. This is how we define that. It is a, it is a persistent field that is, it's saved in the database. We have its name, its screen prompt or title, some notes or comments. Here I've defined that it is going to be an enumeration and a normal enumeration that is a combo box with a fixed number of static values. Please note that enumerations can also be a Boolean that is a checkbox, meaning true or false, yes or no. And enumerations can also be multi-choice, but in this case, this is a normal enumeration. Here is the enumeration that I'm referencing. And I have the opportunity to choose that off of a list of values of enumerations that are in the system. There are a number of enumerations in the system. Walk through the assistant. It's also possible to define a default value. And this, these are those DB values. So I can set to no value if I want, or I can have it default to be a priority one. Again, it's public and approved. And now I've defined PO priority. And I simply need to, again, synchronize. And we'll see now it is completely synchronized. So going back to my, my purchase order, 
one thing that I need to do before when I create new custom fields or, or modify them, I need to right click, go to custom objects and do reload configuration. And it'll restart this page, bring a record up. And let's place the PO priority field on this form. Right click, go to properties, layout, use customized screen layout. And if I scroll to the bottom, we'll see my custom fields that are defined. I can expand this out a little bit. You can see here that custom field, yes. And I simply click PO priority. You'll notice now it popped up and appeared here. Now I want to move it into a position. So I highlight it, it turns yellow, and I have the ability to use these directional arrows to move it to where I wish it to be placed on the form for the users. I can expand the box a little bit if I choose. Oh, it's a little bit too big. We'll make a quick adjustment on that. And there we now have PO priority. I'm just going to refresh this. And I have the opportunity to then drop down and choose priority one in this case. And hit save. And that is now stored in the database as a custom field against the purchase order. And you might remember that I had set this to have a default. So when I create a new record, you'll watch this PO priority field. And you'll notice that it defaults to priority one per the definition that I set when I set up the custom field. We'll do one more thing here. I'll give a quick review on custom logical units. And I've got that in my recent screens. So here is where I defined a new custom logical unit called company vehicles. The prompt is what the user sees on the screen. The logical unit name is what is referenced in the database. I've got down below five attributes that I've added to this particular custom logical unit. These attributes are the columns in, in the table, if you will. And I can see the different types, the attribute name, the prompt is what will be seen on the screen. And I can see the type of object that it is. For example, the year I've defined to be an enumeration that is a combo box. All the rest of them are persistent fields of of various types. The second tab here, custom pages, is where I define the pages that I will use to enter and maintain the data. So the first is I've got a table window. If I right click and view that page, we'll populate it. Here are where the records are and we can quickly add new records here. And now that'll be available to me to be able to use in the application. And I also have the opportunity to define a detail view or form window. We'll take a look at that. And here is that. I can just populate the screen and you can see the different records here that I've created. Here's the one I just created, the Dodge. Here's the Ford, the Chevrolet and the other Chevrolet. Going back to that custom logical unit definition, just wanted to mention there is, you'll notice a checkbox out here called create projection. And this is where we can create custom logical units, not only to be seen in the Enterprise Explorer client, but also the new Arena client. Now I'll quickly demonstrate using that custom logical unit 
I've got a recent screen here for my employee file. And here, what I'd like to do would be to add a custom reference on the employee file and place it on the screen. So I right click, go to custom objects, fields, and here is, I've already predefined this so I can place it on the screen now. I have assigned vehicle. I right click, go to properties, layout, use custom layout, and click on assigned vehicle, highlight it, and move it into position. Click OK. And now you see I have assigned vehicle available to me as a custom field on the employee record. I had already gone in and defined that the 2018 Ford will be assigned to this employee. And I can modify that. I click list of values and it returns to me a list of potential vehicles that can be assigned. You can see there's the new record, the Dodge Caravan that I created. Simply select that and hit save. And now I have assigned that this employee is assigned this particular vehicle. And we'll give you one quick last example on using that same custom logical unit again. If I go to uh, my company master, we'll go into company and I'll bring up a company record here, my company 101. What I want to do is I want to add a new tab out here, a custom tab that shows me all of the company vehicles. So I right click, go to custom objects, tabs, create new. Here I'm going to define the page that I want to be the tab. So I go to my list of values and I can see my company vehicle. Notice I have two, I have company vehicle and company vehicles. That's the detail window. And then this is the table window. I'm going to choose the table window. Click OK. Here's the title of the tab. I can modify that. I can add a comment. And then I have to define the keys. That is, what is the parent key that will filter the information on the, on the custom logical unit? Uh, so on the parent key, I want to choose company. Sorry, right there. And on the child key, my custom field dollar company. And I click OK. And now, depending on the company here, it's going to filter the company vehicles to show only vehicles in that company. And now you can see how quickly I added a custom tab referencing a custom logical unit with custom fields, with five custom fields, with a custom enumeration. In my case, I created one for a year. So that concludes this overview and demonstration of the extensibility module or custom objects in IFS application. Thank you.